about to go into, though, is this tweet. They kind of set off a firestorm. Coop was really going in on the thread, too. Um, Elliot Wilson. I didn't really um, go in. You didn't really go in? Okay. Elliot Wilson it. of <laughs> Rap Radar um, and founder of uh, Ego Trip magazine back in the day. Um, <clears throat> editor at the Source magazine, right? Later on, the XXL. Music, music editor at the Source. Music editor. Editor in chief at Double XL. Gotcha. Thank you. And yeah. Um, yeah, so he put out this tweet. It says, It was written was hated upon arrival. Today, many folks feel it's better than Illmatic. Hip hop is wild, Joe. Hi. That's an interesting statement from him uh, because the fans weren't the ones that were, as he say, says, that hated it. it was written upon arrival. Fans actually received it was written pretty well. It was the critics and the writers. And um, I know often Coop talks about the Vibe article that he read back in the day where it kind of started this Nas nice slander. Do you want to talk a little bit about that and some of the things that we were saying offline before I go into the Ego Trip article? What, the personal things that I shared with you? Uh, yeah, as far as like, you know, the Vibe article and, you know, what that kind of did to you as a listener and as a writer. Well, yeah, so, I mean, so it was written coming out the summer of 96, so I'm not even 15 yet. I'm actually 14. Right. And when I ended up going to high school, um, I, school in North Carolina worked a little different at the time. High school started in 10th grade. So fall of 1996 was my uh, technical freshman year of high school at West Charlotte. I signed up for the journalism staff because I've always been a writer my whole life, and Obviously, they didn't really have a hip-hop writer or anything like really hip-hop going on. And I was fresh off being in Upward Bound and hearing it was written, like constantly. It was written and Reasonable Doubt were what was playing on the Upward Bound bus outside of like the classic hip-hop stuff that we already had playing as far as like the new stuff. Um, I wrote my first, my first, my first like published piece, I guess. My first published piece of writing is a music review of It Was Written and Tony Braxton's Secrets. Mm. So it was written with my first real music piece, my first real writing piece and everything. And I told you, like, I questioned everything that I wrote in that article and even my musical ear and my taste based on how they were explaining what it was written sounded like the, to them. And so people have to understand, too, this is 1996. I'm from Charlotte, North Carolina. I'm raised in Atlanta, but I'm back in Charlotte Hip hop's different in 1996, and so is like the credibility. Like Vibe and their journalists had credibility, mm -hmm. you know. And a lot of these people, like the gentleman who wrote it, um, what's his uh, what's his name? Like I just, it's missing me right now because I'm not uh, in. About, uh, Chris X. Yeah, Chris X. Well, yes. I mean, he's from Brooklyn. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? I'm a kid that's from Charlotte, North Carolina, that loves hip hop the way that he does. But when somebody like him is writing a piece like that about somebody who's becoming my favorite artist because I'm 14 years old at the time. He's not my favorite artist. I'm actually gravitating more towards Andre. You know what I'm saying? Because I'm mm -hmm. from down here. You know what I mean? Right. I'm going to find like a um, like some of the pieces of what uh, Chris X said in that Vibe article because I want to no, let people I, I know. I have some of it right here. Oh, you no. got some of it? Because yeah, I yeah, couldn't find I the I article. I go back into my other notes. Okay. okay. <clears throat> he said one of the problems with some of the problems with it was written are that are not in what it is written or how it flows, but in its consistently aggressive attempts at pop music. Mm. Example, when Nas arrived, he was touted as a microphone god. He remains a poignant figure with a, par with a panoramic view of the real and metaphorical ghetto. And his flow is still astounding. But Nas requires, Nas requires a sonic tapestry as multi-hued and breathtaking as his rhymes. And then the pop success he obviously desires will occur organically. It was written as adequate. Unfortunately, though, Nas's own second coming isn't nearly satisfying as the first one. That's how that review ends. I remember mm. that. That's a striking way to end somebody's review for their sophomore album. You get what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Now, yeah. let me go to what I remember from that article that I couldn't find a quote on. He starts off that way. Mm -hmm. He starts off like almost all Nas pieces start off. 
talking about Illmatic and Illmatic's place in history. Keep in mind, this is literally two years removed from Illmatic. Mm -hmm. And this is where I told you I I started questioning things and it became problematic to me. And I'm going to tell you exactly why, because two of the albums he was talking about and that he referenced in relationship to Illmatic, I had heard and and had heard backwards and forward and knew very well by then. You get what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And he said, a lot of people... He's, this is how he said it. A lot of people have debated whether Illmatic is a classic. And the first thing I said to myself is like, ain't nobody down here in Charlotte debating whether the fuck Illmatic is a classic. What is right. he talking about? <laughs> you know, I'm like, nobody, what is that? Period. Like, nobody, nobody on the west side of Charlotte thinks that Illmatic is not a classic that I've seen or heard. You know what I mean? Everybody out here talking about it. You know, <clears throat> it says, and then he says, well, Illmatic is a classic in a sense. And it doesn't call it a full-on classic. Uh, it says it's a in classic. a sense. It says it's a classic in its sense because it bought back lyrics and lyricism. It also brings up the fact that he barely moved 300,000 copies the first year that it came out. That's how I've always gotten, Mike, that's where my knowledge of that comes from, that it didn't sell 300,000 copies the first year. That's how the Vibe article starts. So think about it. The Vibe article starts saying, well, is Illmatic a classic? Well, kind of, sort of. Oh, yeah, by the way. It doesn't move 300,000 units. Like saying, how can you call something like that a classic when Method Man and Biggie are going platinum? And then it says it is a classic, but it's not a classic on the level of, listen to what it said, paid in full, the greatest adventures of Slick Rick, and by all means necessary. Now, the first thing that I thought to myself is, is like, well, I need to go listen to by all means necessary because I hadn't listened to it yet. I had heard Peyton Full and I'd heard The Greatest Adventures of Slick Rick. I was fr- my, so my first thought is I need to listen to By All Means Necessary. My and this is 14-year-old you. This is 14-year-old me. My first thought is I need to go listen to By All Means Necessary yeah. right now. Like right now and hear what the fuck this guy is talking about. My second thought was Illmatic is better than The Greatest Adventures of Slick Rick. And I love me some of The Greatest Adventures of Slick Rick, even the 14-year-old me. It's the first rap album I ever heard from beginning to end. And then I said to myself, he might be on to something with this Peyton Full thing. Because you have to understand, this is still 1996. I just really got put on to rock him and paid in full that summer. So when he started off by saying paid in full, I thought it was some valid. And it's still valid to this day, because for a lot of people, paid in full is the Illmatic of its era. <clears throat> Here's Why something is he even going you to back and comparing Illmatic to those albums during Why the It we... Was Written uh, review? So so that and so that was my problem is it's like, OK, look at how far. And this was what the 14 year old me didn't know. And here's what people need to understand. I didn't understand how far back he was going and how many classics he had jumped over just that came out of the East Coast that he could have compared it to. He had to go back to the best stuff that literally got came out of the East Coast from the 80s. Like he literally went rock him, Slick Rick, KRS-One, their best work. Mike, not not possibly their best work because think about it he didn't go to follow the leader or let the rhythm hit him or don't sweat the technique he went all the way to paid in full this is 1996 rock him has made follow the leader let the rhythm hit him and don't sweat the technique why do you have to commit compare illmatic to paid in full because you already know that don't sweat the technique let the rhythm hit him and follow the leader well as great as they are they're not illmatic and you know it yeah so you have to go to paid in full just to make your point well, at that point, I didn't understand that at 14, but then I started understanding the music. See, like I hadn't heard the low end theory from beginning to end yet at that age. You feel mm-hmm. me? And then I start, you start getting older. It's like, well, why didn't you compare it to the low end theory? That came out in 1991 going into 1992. Right. You know, why didn't you compare it to like what the album by Red? You get what I'm saying? Right. Why are you comparing it anyway? It's like they were going out their way right. and they pick albums that you can't go against. Right, they, they they pick their best classes because I heard by all means necessary, and I'm like, oh well, these are probably the three best East Coast albums that I had ever heard. And Mike, and then I think it takes a nation of millions to hold us back is is the album they named too. And then I went and listened to it takes a nation of millions to hold us back, and I'm like, well, that's just not fair. Right. <laughs> Because in uh, 1996, it's not fair to compare anything to It Takes a Nation of Millions to Hold Us Back. Because the way that album had sat, even in that brief breath of time, it was easily probably in most people's mind who were acquainted with hip-hop the best rap album ever in 1996. Yeah, like, easily. Yeah. It wasn't a question in 96. If it, if, if it Takes a Nation of Millions was considered to be our best piece of rap work. You know what I'm saying? Right. Right. Uh, Jevin June with stuff. the Super Chat says, It was written sounds contemporary even today. It's slick. And it's a lore continues to grow. Uh, Jay Short says, people hate it, Trackmasters. It was written and Mr. Smith have aged well, though. 
I was very critical of Trackmasters too. But when we look back at it, I think that some of this journalistic slander, it kind of starts molding your opinions on things. And I think that that's what the It Was Written slander has kind of, you know, broke forth. We got 007 in the building. He says It Was Written was the best rap album of 1996. Argue with your mama. Well, that's interesting you say that because Ego Trip, they actually have a list or had a list in their magazine. Here's their list of the best albums of 1996. Best hip-hop albums. Uh, number one is Reasonable Doubt. Number two, Iron Man. Uh, number three, Hell on Earth. AT Aliens at four. The Score at five. Muddy Waters at six. Uh, Firing Squad at seven. Stakes is high at eight. Uh, Psychoanalysis uh, at nine. Prince Paul, my man. Don Caluminati. Seven Day Theory at ten. Enigma at eleven. Dr. Octa, uh, uh, Octagonalist uh, at number twelve. Uh, we got The Coming at 13, All Eyes on Me at 14, Bow Down at 15, Hardcore at 16, Illadelph Half-Life at 17, Wrath of the Math at 18, uh, The Hall of Game at 8, I'm sorry, 17, yeah, Hall, the, oh, Hall of Game at 19, Nocturnal at 20, Riding Dirty at 21, um, The Resurrection by the Ghetto Boys at 22, not to be confused with Commons Resurrection, you got At the light, at Speed of Life from Exhibit at 23, 24, you got Ice Cream Man by Master P, and you got Crucial Conflict, the final tick, at 25. Ego Trip, the uh, magazine that was founded by the gentleman that we're talking about here, Elliot Wilson, his publication left, it was written off the top 25 hip-hop albums of 1996. Now, let's just be real. I mean, regardless of what anyone's opinions are on it was written i don't you have to force yourself not to put that album on this list and i say that respectfully i mean come on man come on man you, it, well, you really got the final tick on here by crucial conflict you, you want to say that's a better album than it was written man and I, and come on man so i mean there are a couple things first of all <clears throat> you can argue has a head in terms of what your aesthetic is, but those first seven albums, those first six albums that you listed, it was written belongs with those six albums. Straight up. In, in whatever way you want to call it for 1996. Cause those are the albums that I remember. This is the year that this is the year that I became a head. This was the year. And it's, and so when you're saying AT aliens, I'm like, no, no, that is Yes. Oh, Reasonable doubt. Oh yes, the score. Yes, Iron Man. Yes, and and and, and motherfucking it was written right there. And yeah. also, uh, and also, stakes is high, and, and Illadelph should be higher to me. So there are two things that's going on with here. First of all, they're not only showing the Nas bias; they're showing the Regency bias. Oh yeah, the Tupac albums are too far back. Oh, all shit. eyes on me is where? All eyes on me is at fourteen. Okay, that means you don't like the Biggie and Puffy talk, and you're from New York. Ed with okay. a super chat says, is it safe to say that Nas It Was Written influenced Biggie's life after death sonically and lyrically? What do you think He did about the same that? thing with Ready to Die. The only, reason that, the only reason that DJ Premier is on Ready to Die is because they heard Illmatic. Big and, oh, no, no, no. We got to give Big some of that. Nas just got cream. The stories I told you that niggas bleed is the response to hearing the setup and shootouts on It Was Written. That's where niggas bleed and I got a story to tell comes from. Mm. It, they're sparring with each other, and Nas was always first in the ring. Man, that so with the super chat says, "All eyes on me and riding dirty is too low on that list." I mean, not listen, in man, not ninety six, not ninety six. No, no, ninety six. Yeah, all eyes on me should not be fourteen. Oh, uh, oh, he said all eyes on me too. No, all eyes on. That's what I'm saying. So all yeah. eyes on me goes up. That should go up there where it was written goes. That's what I'm saying. Like it all was eyes on me. Let's there. keep it real, man. Like Pac was running '96, man, and he had the music to match. All eyes on me should really be at the number one spot here. I mean, if we're talking, at least are we top talking, three. Are we talking the best album? Or are we talking all things considered? All things considered. I mean, if we're talking all things considered, it's number one. Yeah. And but and if two. you want to talk I about quote unquote, look, look if it's all if if it's that disc one is number one and disc two is number two and then we can get to everybody else on the list. 
All right, so the same publication that put this out, and again, this is Elliot Wilson's publication, Ego Trip. Here's the actual review that they did for, um, for It Was Written. They did it in a real weird way, too. 007 says, remember how Big and Pop uh, looked at Nas? <clears throat> said, enough said. Jay Short with the Super Chat says, Tim for a hat. Do you think that the New Yorkers were salty at Nas for not going back at Pop? I mean, he was seen as the best lyricist, and he was silent, and his silence was uh, deafening. Let's talk. Hold Let's on. talk about that before we get to the uh, article. Yeah, and I'm about to say, and I'm not done. There's still some comments that I remember from that Vibe article I want to spew out. Okay. Yeah, but go ahead. Uh, the truth says, uh, final tick in that picture. Uh, I'm sorry, and picture, picture this should be top ten. All right, this is what I want to do. Because like I said, the list says what it says, right? But this article that they put out there, and I might need to make this a little bigger. This article that they put out there, they did it in a weird way where they actually reviewed what? It was written and reasonable doubt at the same time? Is that what they did? Unfortunately. Uh Unfortunately for them today, they did. It's called Chickens Coming Home to Roost. (laughs) <laughs> they had no business doing this. How many how, how many ways can we unpack how they had no business doing this? This is what I mean. It's like <clears throat> when I be telling you, Mike, about like how like it's like this is that shit that like Andre's talking about on Rosa Parks. You know what I mean? Like it's like when your favorite people like do sucker shit, like the people that you look up to, it's like the product is like really whack at the end of the day. Mm-hmm. And it's like and it was like I've kind of I've always known this stuff. It's like I've kind of just been cool about it and been quiet, especially since like people keep saying that we're a Nas channel, Mike, but it's like people understand it's not that we're a Nas channel, it's that we're journalists and this is a disservice to one of our greatest MCs that's blatant and obviously being done that's never been done to another MC the likes of him. Like yeah. there's nothing like this shit that we can go search for about Rakim or KRS or Kane. All the way down to the Jay. notion that he's the yeah. worst beat picker. I'm about you know to say, what I mean? We can like, keep it current. Kendrick, Cole, yeah. Drake, yeah. Wayne. Okay, let me get to this article real quick because there's a lot to unpack here, right? Never been this problematic. So we're not a Nas channel. We're just really good journalists who haven't been... I'm not going to say people have been paid to espouse these opinions. It just appears like they have been because they have no credible or integral reason as journalists to do so. Yeah, and again, the people have spoken. They have no evidence. The people have spoken and they want to make it seem like the people were the ones that were saying all these bad things initially. No, that was you guys. Do you understand that when when I got this message, I was literally leaving church with my daughter and I was like, somebody's trying to make me curse or really get me out of character as soon as I leave my place of worship today. This dude is wild for this. And then he talking about some fans are wild. Are the fans wild or are you wild? (laughs) Right. Man. Well, speaking of which, let, let me get to the article. Let's we'll we'll the break this wow, thing down. Him and, him and Mr. X, what's his name? Chris X and Elliot Wilson need to bring their ass outside. Because here's the thing. I want people to go up on XO's Twitter page and ask him to drop this Vibe article that I know he has. Because we're going to talk about how you can find so much of his writing material, but how that Vibe review has conveniently disappeared. His name is XO on Twitter, has an EXO. Let's get that Vibe article put up the way you put up yeah. all your other credible journalistic pieces of work. Yeah. Well, let me get into yeah. this article because um, we couldn't find the Vibe article, but we could find this Ego Trip article where they, you know, the XO on Twitter, where they did the uh, Reasonable Doubt. It was written review at the same time. So mm-hmm. it says, in case you haven't heard, the native tongue has been officially reinstated. While initially Pasta News proclaims on uh, De La Souza Stakes is high, excited me uh, like the flirt from the lovely lady, blah, blah, blah. All right, yeah, let, let's get to the It Was Written talk, right? Let's see. Here we go at the top right here. As we reach uh, to close the summer, two of the season's most important records, Nas' It Was Written and Jay-Z's Reasonable Doubt, are still lingering in the mind. While Jay, the author author of the gold double-sided 12-inch Dead Presidents, Ain't No Nigga, has an album uh, reigning supreme on on all places, the top of the Billboard pop charts, who, let's see... 
Who could have predicted that hip hop's favorite son, Nasir Jones, would become a certified pop phenomenon? Yes, Nas's 1994 debut, Illmatic, was an underground masterpiece. Once again, it started with Illmatic. It's an underground masterpiece. And while they caught their fair share of flack for it, the old school editors at the Source magazine were right when they awarded it the Covenant 5 mic rating that proclaimed it a hip hop classic. However, when Illmatic struggled in the marketplace, don't think anyone at Nas's label at Columbia felt um, content with the critical kudos. Uh, returning on It Was Written with the commercial proven production team Trackmasters with whom he shares management, Nas does his best to make their collaborations effective. Unfortunately, he is subverted by the record's attempt at proving uh, a universal vibe. The extra cheesy disco groove of the arithmetics uh, inspired Street Dreams. The, uh, the No Joe, uh, like synthesized lazy, watch them niggas, and the lyrically enchanting but um, superficial and bubbly Black Girl Lost are representations of the more mature Nas sound. Even worse, it was written's Dr. Dre Nas marquee matchup, Nas is Coming, winds up being its um, deuce shot at bicoastal unity that Dre should be ashamed of himself to put his name on the credits. Uh, Nas is better served when he's sticking to the street instinct, collaborating with Mob Deep on the clever, the setup, and the pulsating live nigga rap, uh, establishing with his click the firm, um, affirmative action, blah, blah, blah. Let me get to this other part. Okay. So it says, uh, these moments all hint that somewhere within the gold-plated body of Nas uh, beats hearts still fill with uh, the troubled streets of his hometown, Queensbridge. Equally proud of his roots and his status as a product of his environment is Brooklyn's Jay-Z, who is first introduced uh, to rap fans on the side uh, of Marcy Project's MC uh, Big Jazz with Tongue Twisting the Originators. After experiencing his up and most downs into his own hand in forming Rockefeller Records, ever since his future has become so bright that uh, we need to borrow his homie uh, Biggie's Versace shades. <laughs> in fact, Notorious Big crashes the block party on Reasonable Doubt uh, on the Ohio Players Loop, Brooklyn's Finest. Blah, blah, blah. Okay, great things to say about that. So they kind of bring it back around. They say, in many ways, Jay-Z is uh, the personification of everything Nas, is with, Nas wishes he could become. While Jay-Z is a confident, low-key Big Willie who whips his custom-made Lexus uh, through dangerous areas, an introverted Nas looks out his bedroom window and dreams of one day owning such a traveling mobile. Thanks to Lauren Hill of the Fugees, whose sultry vocal tones on um, If I Ruled the World spurred It Was Written's commercial playback. Nas is now privy to any and all perks that a young man could want. Nas has been blessed by the Fugees, quadruple platinum touch, and all Jay-Z has uh, at his disposal is a sore throat assistance from hip-hop's non-crossover queen Mary J. Blige on Can't Knock the Hustle. They owe Mary J. Blige an apology for that slander. Um, it may be unfair to dismiss Nas's success as merely piggybacking off of El Boogie and her refugee camp, but I can come to no other conclusion for the year's most surprising success story as almost overnight. Nas the Martyr has become Nas the Superstar. Meanwhile, Jay-Z is somewhere lounging on a leather couch, sipping ice-cold bottle of Moet, uh, since he still runs his own operations and puts out his own shit. Jay-Z, when all said and done, divvied up while probably making more money. Sorry, Nas. The world is still up for grabs. <sighs> bang, bang, bang. Well, you know what? First of all, to address the whole <laughs> help thing, with them sitting here saying that Nas piggybacked off of Lauren Hill in the Fuji success. They recorded If I Ruled the World in 1995. Um, the Fuji's weren't anything in 95. 
When the score dropped, and let's keep it real, I want to say uh, Fuji Live was around January or so. I think Killing Me Softly was around May. And that's when the record starts selling like crazy, right? And I think if I ruled the world, I may be wrong, but I feel like it was before. It was released as a single before um, Killing Me Softly. Killing Me Softly. Yeah, because I feel that way too. it was written actually dropped in July, right? June, July. And if Killing Me Softly came out in May, I'm pretty sure If I Ruled the World was out before that. So, first of all, it's just dishonest to even say that, you oh, yeah, they're on. sitting here like, yo, you need to get with Lauren Hill or whatever so you can have a hit. No, it wasn't like that. They recorded this record a year before the Fuji success. Well, 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 well let's start with a couple things. First of all. Okay. And I'm going to get to the we, Super Chats, too. No, no, no. I didn't forget but, y'all. Yeah, because they, um, they're, they're, I like how they point out the Trackmaster's management relationship conveniently. But they don't point out the Fuji's label mate relationship. The Fuji's are signed to Columbia just like of Nazis. Of course, of course. So, so record label companies, when they have artists, it's easier for them financial, P and L sheet wise, artists work in house together. Of course, because so, all that money stays in house. Because the money stays in house. Yeah. If black people look. If black people would stop talking about that and understand that, they would understand why these companies have money because they see a group like the Fugees working on their sophomore album and an artist like Nas working on his sophomore album, and they're like, "Hey, right." It promotes one another, and not to mention, obviously, the labels getting the cut from whatever feature uh, fee that you got going on. So yeah, it the same budget that they're giving Nas. They're getting it back when he solicits for, you know what I'm saying, Lauren Hill. So that just makes sense. Uh, Dumb it down with the Super Chat says, it was written as number one in 1996. But don't you think that that article uh, is the same as when you bring up Rakim and talking about Lupe or bring up Shaq when he's about uh, about Wilt? I don't oh, see the correlation. Hold but. On. Here's some, here's some, here's some hip-hop history for you. That, that I forgot and that people need to understand. The relationship with Salah Remy mm -hmm. is forged because of the relationship with the Fuji. Of course. Because they went on tour together. I mean, they were they went on tour together, 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 but he's a producer on the score. So let's see. Fuji La was re released January 9th. The album was released February 13th. Salah Remy, of course, produced Fuji La. I mean, we all know. Yeah. The second, Mike, you're right. The second single, Killing Me Softly. May 31st, 1996. Oh, that's at the very end of May. That's damn near June. So let's see when If I Rule the World got released. Because if Fuji La is all they got, what I'm telling you, because here's the thing. About when, when, did that, when did that article, that Ego Trip in Peace, actually drop? Because um, I would imagine it had dropped when the album dropped. So, you know, they had to hear it. Probably got their advanced copies. Had to be around June or July, I would imagine. Um, um, 007 of the Super Chat says... Who paid the writer? Honest question. No, 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 no. We're gonna we're gonna get to some of the alleged stuff that we really don't know. My man Swain with the super chat says, "Remember uh, on Machiavelli when Pac said Nas was the alleged ringleader." Ringleader. Yeah. Pac respected Nas as the illest on the East Coast. Uh, LP with the super chat uh, says, "Elliot literally says Nas won a chip because of Steph and Jay won a ring without anyone, any other star." Hold on, Such bias. Is, oh, I'm going to address so, that, too. He said him and yeah, his lady too. have been toxic. And one more super chat, and I'll let you go. I'm sorry. Um, well, you're fine. Mike 100 says, question to Mike. Was Reasonable Doubt better than it was written? I think that it was, but I think that at the end of the day, when we talk about how both records affected hip-hop in the moment nationally, I don't see how you can rank it over you know, it was written at the time. I think one of the biggest things about Reasonable Doubt and how it's grown is because of who Jay became. Mm -hmm. In the moment, I would have to say it was written had a much bigger impact on hip hop altogether. It's not even a, it's not even a question of that. Reasonable yeah. Doubt was one of those albums that it's like, oh no, this guy's going to be around for a very long time if he doesn't go to prison. Mm -hmm. Like that's what that was that first year. That's like the, the first the next six months. Was like, no, this guy's great and he's going to be around as long as, you know, he can stay out of trouble. In the last yeah. Super Chat, before I let you go ahead and talk, uh, Wellverse Session says, uh, the rise of Nas, Cypress Hill, and Fuji's. Why not that Rough House movement uh, get more respect? 
Salam's another underrated piece in that puzzle. <laughs> yeah, they, we need to talk about them more. But go ahead, Coop. Okay, so the first thing that we need to realize is like, okay, so look at how they're framing the whole piggybacking off the Fuji's thing, okay? Mm -hmm. So If I Ruled the World is released on June 4th. So literally, they got released five days apart. Yeah, so, yeah. Killing, so Killing Me Softly is dropping, and then literally, within a week's time, not even a full seven days, If I Rule the World comes out. And you so know what? what? It's I'm not just, like in today's time, like you drop a single and the shit blows immediately. No, Back then, what, things needed time to actually no, bubble. So this, they were bubbling at the same time. No, this is, no, listen to what I'm saying. This is brilliant marketing and promotion by Columbia Records. Yeah. Fuji La has already started to take off. So the Fuji's album has been out for three months now. They've been living off of one single and um, have already started selling records. This is part of the Fuji's push towards all those records sold too because putting Lauren Hill with Nas keeps her hip hop cred valid while she's singing a Roberta Flack tune. Yeah. Let's unpack over also, over Tribe's loop. But I'm about to say no. Let's yeah. unpack how. And this is what I always didn't like. I'm not a big, big fan if I rule the world. It's not like one of my favorite Nas songs. I think it's a dope-ass record, though. But the I way agree with you tried, 100%. The way people tried to make it seem like this was a pop crossover hit is one, and this is what I'm talking about. This is on the, on the integrity of the journalists because these journalists from New York know that's a Curtis Blow theme that he took especially at that point because the people who were grown men and women who were writing this in 1996 grew they lived curtis through blow just the like curtis nas. blow yeah who grew up on curtis blow just like nas don't act like you don't know where this theme comes from yeah. so if i'm not mistaken the original theme of that came from like a new york based musical like from like you know world war ii or 50s or something like that but you know in hip-hop context that nas taking that is taking that from curtis blow that's hip-hop that's not pop that's, that's not, not pop. Pop. I mean, you're right i didn't think about that but you're right that narrative of this being a pop infusion and all that's no. totally inaccurate because no. you're saying that curtis blow is pop then it's actually this is as hip-hop as it gets right no, listen, listen to what i'm about to say it's actually the only time Nas has done a hip hop remake. If I ruled the world, is Nas's only hip hop remake. He never does other people's shit. He's doing Curtis Blow shit. Don't tell me that's not hip hop. And it's only eleven years removed from that song. It's not like it's old or faded in people's memory. Okay. Second of all, don't tell me that having Lauren Hill singing on your hook is pop or crossover in 1996. She's just starting to get her props as a singer. Part of those props is because of this record accompanied with Killing Me Softly because most people weren't acquainted with her outside of Sister Act and Fuji La. What they Tell had to say that. about Mary J. Blige was totally disrespectful. We gonna get to that. And you know, and let's not sit here and act like Mary was washed on reasonable doubt. Like, you know what I'm saying? Mary was bigger than, than Lauren. Right. And, and you know, they, they wanted to try to downplay Mary to big Hold up on. Jay more, which I think is really messed up. They shouldn't they have done it like to, that. Listen, they trying to downplay Mary. Let me tell another people a piece of history got nothing to do with hip hop. Well, Mary Jane never sung back up on a song for Lauren, but Lauren has sung back up for Mary J. Blige. All that I can say. The first release yeah. of the Mary album. That's Lauren Hill singing back up to Mary. It's fact. Faith Evans. No, Faith Evans used to sing back up to Mary. Around this same time that they're talking, when faith shit is popping, as soon as I get home and can I come over and you used to love me, they're trying to tell me that her backup singer, Mary when, J. Blige. When right, is not going to cry, man? Not going to cry is 96, ain't it? That Just, is 96. That's what you may tell. No, are no, they serious? That is affirmative. That is affirmative. Which is her best vocal performance up to that point. That was That's a big it. ass. It's one of her biggest songs, period. And they sitting here calling Mary yeah. washed. Vocally, it's one of her best songs, too, for the time. If you go listen to all her stuff, like, you know what I mean? She's a much singer on Not Gonna Cry than she is, like, on all that other stuff. She's just more soulful. Way better singer on Share My World by Mary. Jay Short says, uh, people live vicariously through Jay. And that article is proof. Not saying Mary that Jay is. isn't talented, but he's a hustler, so people can relate. Nas is a prodigy and so talented, some can't relate to that. 
Yeah, it it was almost like they was trying to get brownie points unnecessarily. No. Like, so, so, hold on. So let me understand this. LP also <laughs> says, "Ain't no nigga uh, is more pop than if I ruled the world." Okay, that's facts. So let me get this straight: a Curtis Blow theme with Lauren Hill singing the hook and Nas, not 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 ninety six Nas rapping on it. That's pop and crossover. No, you niggas is whack. And that's what I mean about how they <laughs> change the integrity of stuff right there. It's like, no, because when you grow up, I'm like, I grew up and I was like, and then I realized certain. I'm like, no, you niggas are just whack. And it's like, then you start asking yourself, it's like, well, why did they even do that to Nas? It's I like want to get to this sentence and dissect this real quick, man. Where he says, no Nas is now privy to all the thing, all the perks a young man could want. Talking about his crossover success. Kind of like they're hating on the fact that he's Haters. actually in the news, right? But this is the part I really wanted to get to. Nas has been blessed by the Fuji's quadruple platinum touch. And all Jay-Z has at his disposal is the sore throat assistance from hip-hop's non-crossover non queen, Mary J. Blige on Can't Knock the Hustle. Hey, can I tell you something? Wow. Hold on. If Mary J. Blige takes Killing Me Softly and sings it in, behind that beat, she's going to sell. Just, just uh, telling you. Uh, Non-crossover Queen did very well on I'll Be There For You and Method Man, right? It's a platinum That's singer. one of the biggest records of its time. Makes me want to look up how many records just the single song. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Since we're going to do that, like, Could come on, been. man. Disrespect to Mary J. Blige just so y'all can sit here and downplay Actually, you want to know world? what? First of all, Mike, you went out. I can't see you. Oh. Let's see. This would happen in the middle of a broadcast. Technical difficulties. Let me see something real quick, Coop. Yeah. Are you still on there? No, I'm here. But okay. people, I don't know if people can't see me or can't nah, see I'll you. I paused on mine. Let's see. Okay, I can right, see you now. I'm back now? Okay, go ahead. What were you yeah. saying? No, I'm I'm I, no, I'm just about to look up like the record sales of it because it's like I'm wondering if I rule the world even did what if I'll be there for you did since we're talking about sore throated Mary J. Blige. Nine I'm crossover certain, cause, queen. No, because I'm pretty certain the summer before her and Method Man made made like one of the ten best hip hop songs ever, which which if I rule the world is not that. As much as you know. And just, again, let's not sit here and act like you know. Biggie's not on Reasonable Doubt. Let's not act like Mary's not on there and trying to downplay Mary and who she is. Um, yeah, I mean, Jay held it down on Reasonable Doubt, right? But let's not act like ain't no help there. Yeah, so the single alone originally sold over 800,000 copies and was certified platinum by the RIAA. Listen, uh, this is literally June 3rd, 1995. The song reached number one on the R&B singles chart. Yeah. Not the rap charts. I'll Be There For You was number one on the charts. Has in period, point blank, a position it held on Billboard for three weeks. It won Grammy for Best Rap Duo Performance. Sore Throated. Who's Sore Throated? She fresh off a Grammy. What I mean, she fresh off a Grammy? It's disrespectful. Well, I mean, she fresh off a Grammy, Mike. Probably around the time they were recording Can't Knock the Hustle, she had just won this Grammy for I'll Be There For You. Because the Grammys get aired in what? February, right? Right. Reasonable Doubt drops in June, right? Right. Yeah, yeah. So she's singing this hook right around the time she's winning a Grammy and on number one on Billboard charts for three weeks. Somewhere you don't find black people in 1995. All right? Well, one of the other things, too, is the fact that they were, um, you know, they were casting aspersions <laughs> that Jay-Z is the the man that Nas aspires to be. And I'm like, I don't understand where they collected that from based on the two albums. And again, why even make those comparisons? Because it seems like whenever Nas comes with something, they want to find ways to compare it to something. Like you said before, in the Vibe article, they were talking about it was written, or the Vibe article was for it was written, it's reviewed. But they were talking about Illmatic and comparing it to the great adventures of Slick Rick and paid in full. It's like, why can't we just sit here and critique the actual work? But I guess, you know, you can't bash it if you don't compare it to something. <clears throat> uh, unknown with the Super Chat says, Jay bragged about doing the song with Mary. 
Um, I did joints with Mary J. Mary Blige. J. Blige that's yeah. yeah, that says it all. I mean, that was a big deal to actually mm -hmm. get Mary on the album. It was a huge deal. 007 says it was written uh, was a street album. Columbia had issues with Nas because they wanted him to go commercial. I am getting bootleg forced to, uh, him to go on, into going commercial. <sighs> What so where does this where does this animus come from? And again, oh you, my god, hold on, hold on, listen to this, hold on, think about this. Uh -huh. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. No, no, no go, go ahead. <laughs> I'll finish my thought when you go. Go ahead. If I rule the world is a song by Nas featuring Lauren Hill, has the first single from it was written. <laughs> listen, it is based on a 1985 hit of the same name by American rapper Curtis Blow. Listen to this and samples the beat of Friends by Houdini. Lauren Hill's verse interpolts, uh, interpretates the song Right Up to the Sun by the Delphonics. Tell me Nothing what pop there. that is pop or crossing over. It has elements of Curtis Blow, Houdini, and the Delphonics. How much <laughs> more soulful in hip-hop do you want it to be in 1996? Their journalistic integrity has been compromised by something, Mike. And we're yeah. not saying it's money. I'm not saying niggas paid you. I'm saying it looks like niggas paid you because there's no excuse for your journalistic integrity to get compromised in 1996 to this point knowing this shit. They know this shit, Mike. They're older than we are, and they're from New York. Yeah. They, knew, they knew where that beat got sampled from the moment that they heard it drop. They knew where the theme came from the moment that they heard it. And Mike, also, too. They had heard Lauren Hill rap on the score. Ain't nothing pop about Lauren Hill on the score. Ain't nothing crossover people. about Lauren Real Hill on, heavy on the score. She out here out. She lyrically is out rapping everybody not named Nas in 1996. And you telling me this is pop? You know, they also knew that using the term pop would be kryptonite to a Nas fan who's coming off of Illmatic. They used that term pop to tear down no, this effort. It's, it's like this, Mike. It's like that's the algorithm and how the algorithm used to exist. You could still say certain words back then, and it would trigger certain things. Trigger words, yep. Or calling Nas pop after Illmatic. Oh, no, no, no. You're trying to put certain things into the algorithm. That's defamation. There's no, like you said, there's no point of reference to any of this being pop. You got the Delphonics, you got Houdini, and you got Curtis Blow. And, and you it's got Nas Lauren rapping. singing and Nas is rapping on all three verses heavily. And he's not rapping. I was about to say. Yeah, he's not singing this rapping. This isn't this isn't Dr. Knockboot or you won't see me tonight. Right. Mad Max with the Super Chat says, to the people in the chat, Lauren Hill uh, don't sing better than Mary. Stop saying that, man. All yeah, I'm man, Mary's a better singer than Lauren. It oh. is. It is what it is. Uh, I, I'm people, just... the super chat says uh, the last paragraph trash uh, brought up money. Ugly. The single look. This is how. This is what if I rule the world did since Mary can't sing. It reached number fifty three, while Mary was number one the year before. This is what I'm getting right, and I see somebody saying something about uh, they wanted Nas to say underground and broke. I feel like okay. whatever Nas was coming out with, they were gonna trash it anyway. Mm -hmm. If it was something that sounded like Illmatic, they would have trashed it for that. Right. They'd be like, oh, he just did this again. You were supposed to be our child prodigy that was supposed to grow. Why didn't you get better like Rakim did on Follow the Leader lyrically? Literally, this, did. this top 25 listing for 1996, that tells you all you need to know. That it's right like there no. just lets you know that they got something against Nas. I, I mean, I would love... If Elliot Wilson's out here talking about it was written again and talking about it was hated upon arrival and this and that, I would love for Elliot Wilson to speak on like what you got against Nas because it seems like there's something there. And that Vibe article that you were talking about, I found it interesting that somebody pointed out, I think it was LP, he pointed out in our community section that Elliot Wilson's wife was actually the musical editor at Vibe at the time as well. So... I mean, so, I, everybody was on code with hating on Nas at the time. No, no, no. So, so let's jump down the Danielle Smith rabbit hole right quick. Let's go. First of all. Tim for a Kofi uh, show today. Right. No. First of all, Danielle Smith has a journalist. Oh, her integrity and her writing and who she is is above both of these dudes, Chris X and Elliot Wilson. Let's go ahead and put that on Front Street. 
whatever they aspire to be as a journalist is actually who she is. And this is what I mean about integrity being compromised, because here's what I mean when I did my research. And people don't understand hip hop used to be different. See, Danielle Smith, she from the Bay. She's not from New York. She's from San Francisco, Oakland area, I believe. She's from the Bay Area, okay? Mm -hmm. So she's the music editor for Vibe when this piece about when the Vibe music review by Chris X is being done. And what I'm telling you is, that, and I'm telling you this as a guy, like I'm not speaking as a journalist, I'm speaking as a man. And I'm speaking because I know what time it is. Oh, well, if she dating a dude from Queens while she's the music editor of Vibe, and that dude is telling her that that Nas album isn't anything. I'm not saying it compromises her integrity, but I'm saying in 1996, yeah, that probably influences her opinion somewhat. Like, you're a man, Mike. You've been in a relationship with a woman. You know the things that you need to do and say to a woman to get your way, to get her to understand certain things when she's your woman. You get what I'm saying? Especially when y'all are younger, especially if you're playing the same game. So how this chick, even if she likes it, was written, I don't mean to call her this chick like that. She's an astounding journalist. We're going to get to some of her credentials in a minute. She actually has real credentials that are like viable, incredible, unlike these two gentlemen, outside of just them being good writers. Outside of them being good writers, they don't have credentials like that. She got credentials, Mike. She is the first black female editor-in-chief of a major publication. Yes, she is. Because she became the editor-in-chief of Vibe later that uh, the next year in 1997. I can remember the letter to the editor that she wrote when she became... Uh, editor-in-chief, it is one of the more inspiring letters to the editors I have ever read in my life. Mm. She's the shit. But if ever she was compromised, it's probably some dude from Queens who she's dating when they're younger, getting her to believe that, that it was written. She didn't like that. So when this Haitian guy from Brooklyn is sliding this across her desk, well, she's probably with it, might even pass it over to Elliot, like, hey, what you think of this? No, 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 that's spot on. We're kind of doing the same thing over here. What makes it feel like a script is the fact that the way these major publications approach Nas' efforts, it's textbook. Like, they'll start with Illmatic, <laughs> then they'll just start tearing into things that have nothing to do with anything. Like, when I read that part where they were talking about, you know, um, Basically, uh, Jay Z is the guy that Nas aspires to be, and he's outside his project window and stuff. I thought it's about I thought about the takeover and the way mm -hmm. that those uh, digs were coming, and I also thought about like the Rolling Stone article and how they just bring up stuff like, um, um, you know, like alleged uh, abusive allegations from Khalees and stuff, like stuff that has nothing to do with the music. And I feel like this only takes place when it comes to Nas stuff. It's very, it's amazing. It's a, it's a wild rabbit hole to go down because when you start seeing this stuff, and I mean, people thought that we were joking when we posted that page of twenty five albums of nineteen ninety six, no. and it was written wasn't even on there. Like that's personal at that point. Uh, LP with the super chat says, uh, "Hip hop is not pop. If you call it that, then stop." Those were fighting words back then. Same as calling an eighties rapper a sucker MC. The agenda was clear. So uh, Mr. So Miller says Steve Stout says um, on the Bridge podcast that him and Nas heard Lauren Hill's ad libs on "If I Ruled the World" on the score. So I asked her to do a song because they already had the idea to do the song, and it made sense because they were label mates. Yeah, I believe that too. Go ahead, Coop. I'm sorry. No, hold on. So where, so, so where were we? Where were we before the super chat? Before that super chat, uh, super chat. Excuse me. We were talking about the fact that publications seem to pull uh, elements that have nothing to do with the music into these Nas reviews. Yes, and that's no, something no, no. that they've done. Like it seems like <laughs> textbook over and over and over. So can we say something? Can we talk about something very briefly and go down this rabbit hole since we're talking about it from this perspective? Hold on. And also, too, when I mean Danielle Smith has credentials, like like I just named some of her credentials, but also she was one of the uh, voters for the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame once upon a time. Like, she's certified, certified. She's a real journalist. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, and, and I'm saying she's a real journalist because it's like, well, I can only bring her integrity into question by maybe hearsay of who she's dealing with. You get what I'm saying? But yeah. it's like, but no, but dealing with him and letting this article ride, well, that kind of got her out there with them today, even though I find her 
as a journalist to be superior to both of them, uh, accomplishment wise, superior to both of them. And, and, and just like in terms of probably how people view her in the community superior as well. Well, she Elliot's has from Queens, home. right? And you know what? And I'm a fan of what Elliot Wilson has done over the years. And Me too. But for him to be from Queens and dump down on Nas like this consistently, that's, it's very odd. Like, well, that's it, part and, of what and like I said, the top 25 thing and him being excluded of that, especially since... Ego Trip is very New York biased. It's like, that right there is like personal. You're telling me that It Was Written's not a top 25 hip-hop album of 1996? Come on, man. Well, also, too, this is what I mean. It, <clears throat> so this is the other part I want to unpack. I want to bring you that up. Well, it's like well, when somebody from your neighborhood pretty much practices yellow journalism or defamation against you, well, it doesn't just open the door for the black publications to do it. What did you tell me behind the scenes? It opens the door for the white ones to do it. Well, it's true. I mean, when we see the um, the hit pieces that come out on Nas's projects, like the Pitchfork Media, uh, Rolling Stone reviews, and all of that, they learn that from Vibe, Ego Trip, and XXL. Right. And, you right. know what I'm saying? Like, since they already made it okay. The other publications, the mainstream publications the are like... The publications just piggyback. They're like, oh, shit, well, it's cool to dump on Nas. Let me go ahead and do it, too. They did piggyback. it. Piggyback. Yes, it's called the piggyback theory, where it's like literally, you know, monkey see, monkey do, and you piggyback yeah. off of it and, and do the same thing. Well, and we what I'm set saying the is standard that... for our culture, you know what I'm saying? Well, and well, at the time, out. those publications were setting the standards. And yes. once they set that standard... It was just open fire on whatever Nas was doing. Well, well, That's why Hot Nas Seven felt comfortable doing what they were doing. Well, this was a well. This is what I mean, and here's where I don't knock Chris X for that Vibe article as much, or Danielle Smith for letting it pass across her desk for Vibe. Well, Vibe still was more of a black culture R and B and hip hop magazine than a hip hop magazine. Okay, that's true. So. Elliot is from Queens, and he is writing for hip-hop publications and involved with hip-hop publications. So really, if we want to go back to this spear, and if, if how about this? If we were slicing up the pie of who's to blame for this media defamation of Nas, because that's what it is, Mike. It's defamation. It is. It's, the, it's defamation of character, of professional character. Maybe not personal, but it's defamation of professional character. Because like and, LP said, pop was a bad word in hip-hop. In that and day. so and hold on, so listen. Two things that he tried to do: he tried to make Nas seem pop, which takes away your what, your street cred. Nothing matters more in '96 than that. Well, they also okay? took a shot of his street cred when they were talking about Jay and Nas looking out his project window, hoping and wishing the day that he could aspire to be Jay Z. No, so listen, the vibe and the, the article and vibe that, uh, that, that uh, Chris X wrote kind of works that way too, because on Nas is coming. He talks about how, like, Nas is coming. He's like, but where is he going? He lacks vision. This isn't the same guy, like, from the mm. Project Steps. They're trying to make it seem like he's drifting. You know what I'm saying? Like, that's how they mm. talked about Nas is coming. When they talk about Take It In Blood, they're pretty much like, the beat is dull. I remember Chris X saying this. Nas's verbiage pistol whips you. And I never what? forget hearing that. And I'm like... Nas's verbiage pistol whips you. I'm like, what the fuck does is, that mean? Is that mean? virtue like, signaling? I'm like, like, <laughs> I'm like, what kind of metaphor? This is the 14th going on 15 year old. I'm like, I'm like, what the fuck? And I'm a writer. I'm like, what is he? Nas's verb verbiage. I'll never forget that. Nas's verbiage pistol whips you. It's like, so do you like the record? Because I love me some taking the blood. Is he saying he likes the record? And he pretty much saying like Nas is rapping his ass off, but the beat sucks. And I'm thinking like. Well, the beat's not like the best thing on the album, but it's like, it's one of the best songs on the album. Why didn't you say that? But he never really says anything is the best stuff on the album, except for guess what? And this is what I mean about how they tried to theme it. The setup in Live Nigga Rap, Mike. It's like, oh, well, if he does his Queen's Hood shit with Havoc and with Mob Deep, he's dope. But other than that, this new guy sucks. And it's like, I love me some setup. And you know how I feel about the setup. Yeah. That's one of my favorite, favorite Nas joints. And I do agree with them. Oh, to, like for me on a personal level, the setup is probably technically the song that encompasses what Nas is in 96 the most. You know what I mean? Because he's lyrical on there and he's got a storytelling game and he's spitting fire and he's spitting fast and he's spitting hard. It's great. But the rest of the albums don't, Mike. They talk about I gave you power like it didn't exist. I was going to say, 
they omitted I gave you power. At least in an article I just read, they don't even talk about it. And see, the thing is, when you got a record like I gave you power or like a rewind on Stillmatic, we have to those are it. things that you got to talk about. These are records. These right. are records at the time, and I know, um, you know what I'm saying, they've been slightly done before with the bullet personification and all that, but the way that Nas did I Gave You Power and where he took it lyrically, we don't have a lot of points of reference before that to go on based on that record, and for that record to not even be talked about, it's like, yeah, y'all don't want to highlight anything here. LP they the Super Chat says, uh, y'all see him post a uh, XXL cover with Nas. I'm sorry, he said, y'all see him post the XXL cover with Nas. He's seen the heat coming his way, and he tried to <laughs> save face. Anybody who is a true hip-hop head knows about his bias. No, no, no. I, you know what? what I'm, I'm just getting hip to the game, because like no. I said, I've been a fan of Elliot Wilson, and I never really under, I never no. really acknowledged, you know, how biased this comes across in his previous writings, man. It's, I've, it's I've been, nuts. I've, Mike, I've been a fan of what he's done overall, because I understand what his contribution is, but I've always known this, and mm -hmm. I'm one of those people. You see, and this is what I mean about like how the streets work. Oh, well, when you do shit like this, you're supposed to lay low and shut the fuck up, too. You feel yeah, me? Yeah, man, I mean, because that tweet <laughs> just opened up a can of worms. Right, no, no, no. Mike, I told you when I read that when I got out of church, it's like, oh, you want to talk about it? It's like, that's great, because guess what? I want to talk about it, too. Yeah, you we'll dedicate a whole show to it. Hold on, hold on, hold on, because, no, 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 because for real, like, he from Queens, he know what time it is. Shut the fuck up. And so he about to get this smoke. Because he should have stayed quiet. Because I'm one of the people that do know. But it's like, yeah, I like you. And I respect you. And I know what you've done for the community. So it's like, we just going to give it a pass. But you need to be quiet. Yeah, you need to You want to come out and talk wild? I'm about to do you wild. Because it's like, I know what you've done. Let's talk about him and his lack of journalistic integrity. And the respect he doesn't deserve. You know who got Rhyme of the Year in 1995, right? Who's that? Red Man for How High, the third verse. Oh, okay. The original third verse. The full third verse got rhyme of the year. Over verbal intercourse, huh? Fascinating. Yeah. Uh, He's not the music editor in 95, though. He's the music editor in 96. Let me tell you what happens when he becomes the music editor. You know, the year end issue is when you do the rhyme of the year. Right. Do you know the rhyme that's at the year? You know the rhyme at the year end of 1996? You know what the rhyme is? Probably something on Reasonable Doubt. No, it's the third verse from I Gave You Power. But it doesn't say rhyme of the year. It's just the third verse from I Gave You Power. Uh. In December, when it's been out for six months. And then they didn't even talk wanna, about he, it in the review. He, he wouldn't even put it as the rhyme of the year when he became the music editor in The Source. I'm pretty much his staff probably forced him to post it like... No, we're picking one of the verses from I Gave You Power. He wouldn't even name it Rhyme of the Year. Red Man shit for Rhyme of the Year in 1995. Mike says Rhyme of the Fucking Year. When mm. it's Nas that has the Rhyme of the Year, he wouldn't even post it. Sucker ass nigga should have stayed inside. Super Chats over here, Latoria B. Got all B. kinds of receipts. Latoria B with the Super Chat says, Questlove gave Nas a pretty crappy review when it was written drop. If you can find it, uh, give it a read. I never understood it. I love the album, though. Well, you know, I, okay, that's I interesting. That's very interesting. Uh, well, Verse Session time. says, uh, this reminds me of the hate that Hot 97 gave Wu-Tang. Wu-Tang has uh, limited spins around the same time frame. No, and these are like on. two of our strongest titans. And, you know, Let's... two of New York's strongest titans. And they tried what? to... Take them out we're, the game. Let's keep it real. We're not done. Hold on. So, <laughs> in 1996, didn't Iron Man get four mics? Yep. Okay, so he don't know what he's doing. Didn't, um... Hold on. And this is what I mean about his integrity being in question, since you want to talk. One of the sources greater... I'm going to tell you when I stopped respecting the source in their reviews. When they didn't rate Wu Tang forever, because I didn't feel like it was a classic the way everybody was people talking about. Mm -hmm. But they had every Mike. People understand you had to be outside and understand. Oh, they really had hip hop in the streets on lock like that in 1997 when they, people were preparing for that album. Mm -hmm. And so anything like if they wouldn't have given that album like four and a half or five mics, which I really at the time didn't feel like it deserved. Oh, it would have been upheaval. 
and he caved to the pressure and didn't rate the album because his journalistic integrity now is in full question. He was the music editor of The Source when Wu-Tang Forever came out. Why do we not have an official mic rating for Wu-Tang Forever? How can you miss something like that in 1997? Sucker ass nigga shit is what's going on. And so since you want to put up little tweets when you get older and think you get a hall pass, no, fam, you don't get no hall pass. I was watching you. Streets is watching. What, what's, your homie, what's your homie say? Streets is watching. Blocks <laughs> keep clocking, waiting for you to break. Make your first mistake. <laughs> Has he ever interviewed Nas? I've been looking for it. Have you been able to find it? Have I haven't seen it? an Elliot Wilson Nas interview. Um, I would love to see it. Again, see. man, this comes across him. extremely <laughs> personal. And, and you know, it's very problematic that he's from Queens and then he's doing this. Yeah, like, like somebody said in the chat. It? I think Mad what? Max said, man, ain't nobody from Queens going to tell you it was written as trash. And honestly, you know what? When other artists seem to cross over, because at the time, let's be real. Big was crossing over too. Now you want to talk about somebody who did some pop shit, right? More money, more problems is more pop than anything that Nas attempted. But when Big was doing it, people congratulated it. The same people that were criticizing the moves that Nas was making on It Was Written, they were congratulating Big when he was making those same steps. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? And even... I don't even want to say like the remix is on Ready to Die because that still had kind of an edge. But I think some of the choices on Life After Death, which were well executed, they were very pop crossover choices. And Big got no slander for that. None. No, no. You know what I'm saying? And it's like, let's just be fair. It seems like when other New York MCs would go out there and have crossover success like Nas did, They'd be congratulated for that. They would not only downplay in the fact that Nas was finally moving units, but it's almost like they were damn near mad. Talking about now he can afford that uh, car that Jay-Z drives. Like, what? What are we doing, man? Well, they owe all, Nas like, and Mary J. Blige an apology, man. Well, what is he? Oh, first of all, like Nas is going on his second album. It's like, is Nas like super rich after Illmatic? Well, no. But is he broke? It's like, well, no. Well, the final sentence where they said, um, since he still runs his own operations and puts out his own shit, Jay-Z, when all is said and done and divvied up, will probably make more money. Sorry, Nas. The world is still up for grabs. Like, on, what? Why, why are we talking even, about Why are you even pocket watching like that? Why are, we, why are we talking about the money aspect of right. this? Right. Why are we talking about what this album. artist is making versus what this artist is making? Like, what? <laughs> what are we doing? Again. Is watching. Blocks keep clocking. Again, this is It'll all coming from this original tweet from another Make day where Elliot Wilson says, it was written, was hated upon arrival. Today, Shouldn't many folks feel it's better than Illmatic. Hip-hop is wild, yo. Honestly, it wasn't hated upon arrival. It sold millions of records. How so hated was it? And I want, hold on, and I want Nas fans to understand this, and even people who think this a Nas channel understand this. Because hate is a strong <laughs> word, Coop. No, no, no. Yeah. This is not Jay's fault, even if no, I no. personally feel like Jay may have had a hand in pain for certain things or the people around him. You know what I mean? For some of this happened. Because that's what I keep talking about, the journalistic integrity. No, as a journalist and as a writer, and this is going on over at CNN and Fox and MSNBC for the past couple decades now, too, where the journalistic integrity has been devalued, compromised, and changed, and people are acting like they don't know what the standard is. And so this is a guy who, Elliot Wilson, who has held himself as a standard bearer, and this is what I mean, he's held himself as a standard bearer. Well, he's worked for... And had a major hand in ego tripping the source and double XL and rap radar. That's pretty big shit in our community, wouldn't you say? Oh yeah, very there very. Are, I don't think there's a hip hop writer that has that type of resume. Right. That don't mean you're not a sucker, and that don't mean I don't see you. I don't give a shit about any of that if you compromise your journalistic integrity to get there. And so let's get to another thing too. Well. He wants to create something that's going to compete with the source. So him and Chairman Mao and uh, Sancha Jenkins start ego tripping, right? Right. 
Well, that folds. What do you do soon as it folds, soldier? You go start something else or do you go to your competition that you just got done trying to take under, except they took you under? Yeah. Because right after Eco Tripping goes down, where does he find himself? XXL, right? No, this is the source. When Eco Tripping oh, goes down, he goes, goes to the source. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, so, and then it's, so, it's XXL after that. And so this is what I mean about his integrity. It's like, well, you can't even give Nas Rhyme of the Year. You can't Wu-Tang forever. And it almost feels like you were at the source to set up your next move. So you get to the source in 1996. But what happens in 1999? You haven't even been there a full three years. All of a sudden, there's this imprint called Double XL that's popping up. And you've been slated to become editor-in-chief. Now, what I think is that the store started falling apart right there because this man in particular was more interested in politicking his new ego tripping because he never really wanted to be at the source. And he spent more time politicking and building out his funnel for Double XL than he did doing his fucking job as the music editor of the source. Can we go to my favorite Jay-Z line on Imaginary Player right quick? Talk about investments. I got bail money, double XL money. And then guess who pops up on the first cover of double XL? Boom. I'm going to say less. I'm going to say less right now. Just put that in there. Sucking niggas do sucker shit. Sucking niggas do sucker shit. You know what I mean? It's just like I see you. So it's like the whole move to the source was a clout chase, Mike. He wasn't really there about the music. He didn't do right by those reviews from 96 to 99 either. You know what I'm saying? I think, Capital you know, Punishment got four mics. It's Dark and Hell is Hot got four mics. Iron Man got four mics. They didn't rate Wu-Tang forever. You pop up at the end of 99, Double XL editor-in-chief, you wasn't a good music editor, motherfucker. <laughs> and you know what? I want to talk. I want to say this when it comes to J2. It's like... Whack. People got to understand, though, that Big was still alive. And, and so it wasn't like it was just Nas and Jay and they were picking sides or anything like that. Like they could big, they could have bigged up Jay and been honest about the Nas effort at the same time. Like given that balance, because you know, and I said earlier in the show, I do think Reasonable Doubt is a better album than it was written. But first of all, I don't, I think that as as incredible as both of them are and what they did on their respective albums, I don't think that the review should have meshed them together. I think they put those reviews together to basically. So division, you know what I mean? Like they created a friction. They created from this nothing. environment. The, yes. Like there was no issue or anything. Like they created this friction between two of uh New York's Titans at the time. And again, Pac's still alive. Jay's uh, not a Titan Big's yet. Still alive. Jay's no, not but a Jay's Titan not a Titan yet, but he's emerging, right? And yeah. so it's he's like y'all created this friction out of nothing that wasn't even there and then as we see four years later it comes to a head and then you have even more division in new york media you know what i mean and honestly man we can kind of trace some of those things that are rooted in this into this ego trip article and the vibe article no with the whole nigga you ain't living yeah yeah that, that, yeah yeah, that's that's this article. Witness it for your folks, Pat. Yeah, it's the, it is this it's article. Like, oh, this is where it's coming from. It's like he's Jay. I keep telling people Jay's ahead with a great memory. Mm-hmm. I'm gonna probably tell you one of the happiest days of his life as an artist was reading that article that you read earlier, where his debut project without any major distribution is getting compared to the greatest lyricist of all time on his debut. Yeah, he probably remembers that article word for word in his mind. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. And so when he's doing the takeover, people and people, this is what people have to understand. People always talk about this. The beautiful thing about the takeover when Jay's talking about Nas, and I've always told people this, well, he's talking like a fan because he was one and he's ahead. So Jay is one of the guys that's reading all these articles and these publications when they're trashing it was written and they're bigging him up. And he went right to that moment in the takeover in his mind, the same way I can go to that whole rant at the beginning of the Vibe article about where they compared it to paid in full. It takes a nations of millions. The greatest adventures of Slick Rick and by all means, that's literally the best four rap albums that come out of the East Coast in the last 10. You get what I'm saying? Well, honestly, it's like, you, know, you know, what would be fair, right? Uh, especially at that time. I think it would have been a lot more fair if they would have compared it was written to, let's just say, follow the leader. Like, How let's about do this? that. 
No, I'm, I got something for you. <clears throat> 1994 and 1995 just happened. Can I submit to you? I don't know. If we want to talk lyrically, Liquid Swords, or even AZ's Do or Die. If we're talking mafioso themes, can we go to Only Built for Cuban Links, maybe? Right. If we're talking East Coast hip-hop, well, OC had just dropped Jewels, too. You get what I'm saying? Like, oh, there were plenty of places to go. There are places you could have gone. You could have went to the infamous. Hold on, you could have stayed in the bridge and compared it to the infamous for all I care. You feel what I'm saying? You and infamous. I compare things all the time, and you know what I'm saying? And we, we talk about sports, so obviously the height of competition is cool. Like, I love the fact yeah, that, beautiful. you know, we can kind of you know, dissect things by putting certain things side by side. But in this situation, it seemed like they were put side by side to tear down one and elevate the other. And I don't think that could, should have been the case. I think both of those efforts could have been praised on arrival. And really reading Elliot Wilson's tweet, it comes across as, it comes across as he's kind of upset that people didn't go with the narrative that they said. They said a narrative that obviously people don't agree with because some people, people that I disagree with, say that it was written as better than Illmatic. But that just lets you know that people Here's, weren't thinking the same thing y'all were thinking about this effort. Well, well, or see, at least what, what you wrote about this what, effort. And what they really tried to do, and this is, how about this? I think when I did my top 100 albums, I think I had Reasonable Doubt at 21. Mm -hmm. And I think I had It Was Written at 29. And what I'm saying, what they tried to do is that you have to understand. And this is coming along a time in a hip hop where it's like we're almost 95 percent of the time. Your first album. Is your best thing. OK. Mm -hmm. They knew that Reasonable Doubt and It Was Written were comparable projects because they are, Mike. And I've always told you, it's like, well, if we're going to go beat by beat, I'm still picking It Was Written. And if we're actually I disagree going to with you, but I feel you. Look, and, and we've argued about that, and I think it's close if we're talking production-wise. But I've always told you, it's like, well, if we're talking lyrically, it's don't do not do that, because Nas exists in a place that Jay just goes to at times on reasonable doubt. As in, That's Dead true. Presidents, third verse specifically, The Evils, second verse, Can I Live, uh, verse on regrets. No, 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 he goes there. He's in, he's in the neighborhood. Oh, he's not Nas on it was written because I don't know if Rock M on Payton Full or Follow the Leader is Nas on it was written. I've tell said me this day. on this show before. 1996 Nas is probably the best lyricist I've ever heard. Right, you said that's the best rapper yeah. ever. The best, yeah. the best rapper on lyric. The face of the yeah. Yeah. I mean, it is what it is. It uh, is what it is. So. Well, verse Sessions with the Super Chat says, uh, keep in mind, Nori alluded to Elliot being a sucker on Drink Champs. Elliot is the same guy that would uh, that would give Memphis Bleak the same album rating as Ghostface. If you're fired and he don't like you, you get four mics. Mm. Huh. Right. LP with the Super Chat says, uh, remember Dream Hampton said um, she heard reference tracks from Nas and Jay Electronica on, and Dead Prez that was debunked. Uh, she wrote Jay's book, LOL. Pac hates her too. I remember Dream Hampton talking about that. Yeah, she's I like uh, Dream. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, but yeah, it, it's just, you know, and, and again, I think mm -hmm. that when it gets convoluted and gets problematic is when you have journalists, both on print media and, you know, visual media, who have these relationships with artists. And it's fine <laughs> to have relationships with artists, but what happens is not only are you bigging up one, but you're going out your way to trash another that you don't have that relationship with. Well, well, well listen to what I'm saying. So he, here's what he here's what here's what the real agenda was in relationship to Jay that Nas fans can point to. This this does not make Jay responsible. And this is what I'm trying to say. Well, if reasonable doubt and it was written or comparable, then how is Jay ever going to surpass Nas? Because that means it's not illmatic. You feel what I'm saying? Right, and, and that's so his debut. Yeah. So the goal is to make reasonable doubt seem far superior to it was written because it puts it closer to Illmatic territory. That makes it more of a conversation. If Nas's second album, which the streets ain't feeling as much, is comparable to what people feel like is probably going to be Jay's best shit. You feel what I'm saying? Right, right. Then how can he ever really be? And so that's part of how this narrative change and part of how this takes place. Because here's also what I'll tell you, too. Think about this. 
Volume one, it was written in reasonable doubt, all have the same rating. Why? Mm. Miss B with Super Chat says, I believe that Nas slander comes from Nas giving uh, the people knowledge and hope. I think the hip hop machine wants to keep people dumb, high, and focused on shiny things. I do think that uh, Nas's content does have a lot to do with the approach that journalists take. Um, just like I believe the same thing with Kanye. I believe that uh, the reason why Kanye wasn't getting pushed into the game and was getting suppressed for the records that he had, the records that we all know as being classic now, is because of the stuff he was talking about. He was so, talking about uplifting things. He had songs, I mean, he had the Jesus Walks, man. Like, how do you hear so, that record and say no? We're not so here's what I will quibble with you about um, It Was Written. There are some very, very fascinating thoughts and concepts on there. Mm -hmm. But as far as on the knowledge aspect, if you're really talking about kicking knowledge, Nas really isn't kicking knowledge on it was written like people are saying. Yeah. Okay? Like on Take It In Blood, that's what I mean. Take It In Blood is special because on Take It In Blood, no, he's kicking knowledge on Take It In Blood. You feel what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. I gave you power. You could take that as, you know, him kicking knowledge, but he's kicking it in story Matt form. Cautionary tale. Yeah. Right. You feel what I'm saying? Even on Taking in Blood, he's still saying shit like, my bitches, they be laughing. They high off sniffing coke off of 20 shit, Andrew Jackson. City light spark a New York night. Rossi, hold on, what, what'd he say? Rossi, Martini, Rossi, Martini and Rossi sipping, Sergio Tassini flipping. So mm. he's talking fashion, drinks, cocaine. It's not just kicking knowledge on there, but he is also saying, Currency is made to trust in the Messiah. I'm spending it to get higher. Earth, wind, and fire singing reasons why I'm up early. Trustworthy is a nine that bust early. Like, he's kicking knowledge mm. like that. You know what I mean? But yeah. it's like, it's not heavy like that on it was written. He actually took it down on it was written. The knowledge is on Illmatic. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Jay yeah. Show with the Super Chat says, Take it in blood is Nas' best lyrical performance. It's one of the uh, best lyrical performances ever. And it... I told people, it's like, well, here's the thing with reasonable doubt. If you think that's Jay at his best, well, he doesn't have anything lyrically better than Take It In Blood and I Gave You Power in 96. Don't tell me that shit. Andre should share with the Super Chat says, uh, cool, post your top 100 albums again. We'll get those up. We're, 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 yeah, we're, we're, me and Mike working on so many projects. <laughs> Miss LB has another one. She says, uh, I was talking about the overall slander, not the review on uh, It Was Written. I agree with that too. This um, is the core of but it, though. This, this is, is the core. Yeah, this is where yeah. it starts. This, this is, is where, where it starts. This is where it was, it was deemed to be okay to do, mm -hmm. because if let's just say hypothetically, Rolling Stone goes out there and bashes it was written once you know the hip hop community embraced it, people would be riding on Rolling Stone. But the fact that someone in the hip hop community made it okay to bash this and nobody responded as we should have, then that opens up the door for any publication to say anything about it. Hey, big is big in all of this. Cause I want you to understand part of what helps Jay in this whole scheme of things is it, he, well, he's from Brooklyn right? and big is the guy that's running shit in the public's eyes. Not maybe has an MC to the MCs. No, not big, but to the public's eyes, big, and so when Jay's coming along in that time where Big's influence is heavy, I told you Big's 95, Hitwise was bigger than Ready to Die. He yeah. had Juicy and Big Papa in 94, okay? In 95, he had the One More Chance remix. He had Get Money, Players Anthem, the Get Money remix. Yeah. You feel me? So those are four bangers right there. He only got two in 94. So, so J I'm not saying Jay is piggybacking off of Big. I'm saying media-wise, they can be looking at what Biggie's doing and see Jay coming out of Brooklyn. Marcy and Bed Stein ain't that far. You know what I'm saying? Right. It's like, and then now I start looking at the outlier. Who's the poet from Queens that can't make a hit record? Exactly. He makes pop singles when he makes his stuff. He doesn't have street kid like the guys from Brooklyn. He's the little poet that tries to make the pop crossover hit songs because they don't know, those white publications don't know if I Rule the World samples Houdini yeah. and Curtis Blow. And but these black violence. publications did, and they said nothing, and so we should light their ass on fire first. Again, the so fact that they totally ignored I Gave You Power in the review. They didn't say anything about the message either. 
They don't get no credit. How can you not point? How, how can you this? not talk about the message? I gave you power, silent murder. Like, how do you not even well, bring no, these records on. up? So this is what I mean. So this is how you end up in the negative. It's like, well, you bought up live nigga rap in the setup. Check, check. You didn't bring up the message. Minus one. You didn't bring up taking in blood. Minus two. You didn't bring up shootouts. Minus three. You didn't bring up the travesty that is silent murder in 1996 being on the tape and not on CD. See, if you're a journalist, if you're a journalist, Mike, you know what silent murder is. The fact that they're not bringing up the fact that silent murder is on the tape and not on the CD. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? Y'all don't do, you're not doing your fucking job. Then. They're doing their job. Their job is just to slander it. No, no, no. No, oh, oh, if that's their job, yeah. then their job is poor and so is their journalistic integrity and they don't deserve their job and their positions. You feel what I'm saying? Because if your job is to slander, then you're not a journalist. You're a piece of shit. Because this is a job, because you talk about and deal with other people, your integrity matters. Like in terms of what you will and won't take, how you will deal with things, the fairness and the bias that you give. Like I walked up here and gave Black Star a five this year, and people was like, you need to chill. And I'm thinking, like, I'm being fair. I can't stand these unrighteous ass niggas telling you that they righteous. <laughs> LP with the Super Chat says, yes, uh, yes. <laughs> LT uh, is where he kicks most of the uh, real knowledge. Uh, Lost Tapes. Lost Tapes is where he yes. kicks most of the real knowledge. Do rags. Yeah. Do rags. Purple. I don't yeah. like how it's Diddy did shine with different wo- lawyers. Or when he's uh, explaining on the third verse how we uh, came up uh, making like dye and stuff from the potato liquor and like, yeah, yeah. all that. Yeah. No, that's when he's kicking knowledge. I'm saying it was written in kicking knowledge. Fake thug, no love. You get the slug. CB4 Augusto, you luck, no. Though. But didn't know till I was drunk, though. though. You freak niggas played out, get fucked and ate out. That's not kicking knowledge. Yeah. Probably that's not. Street dreams are made of these. A drug dealer's destiny is reaching a key. That's not kicking knowledge, fam. Man there with the super chat says, uh, do a mock it was written versus reasonable doubt to settle it. We can you do, don't that. Want to do that. Uh, Jay Short don't with want the super chat says, uh, the 25th, it was written anniversary was a lost opportunity. No street dreams, affirmative action remix, no lost tracks, one on one, no additional insight or interviews. They no. just put out that, uh, they, they put out Silent Murder. murder. They and gave that was Silent enough murder. for me. I'm okay. That was I'm enough okay. They put Silent Murder somewhere on the rest of the. No, I'm okay. Because I used to have to go to YouTube to listen to Silent Murder. You know what I mean? Like, like, as a high school student, I had to pay thirty two dollars for a copy from the UK for one song. I paid thirty two dollars for one song <laughs> once, and I did. And then somebody stole the CD from me. It's very problematic. You know, I, I was disappointed with it was written in the fact that I didn't get Silent Murder. I think I held that grudge on it was written for a long time. Like, how did here's, I not get Silent Murder? That's here's true. how much of a head I was, is that I bought the CD, realized Silent Murder wasn't on there because my man Wayne, who worked at the record store with me, told me Silent Murder was on the tape because we used to get a 20% discount. So then I just yeah. went and bought the tape. Then I popped the fucking tape. And I was just like, you want to know it? It was written deluxe from the UK on CD. So mm-hmm. I had a It Was Written regular version and a It Was Written UK version with Silent Murder. Guess what copy got stolen? Uh, definitely. Yeah. Well. So silent murder is important. Yeah, it is important that they get. Yeah, when niggas on the block murder. was seeing both of you, it was written CDs and like, oh, one has silent murder, one doesn't. That's the shit from Coop that I'm stealing today. Right. Jay Shore with the super chat says the biggest indictment is that uh, this was an era where reviewers got music weeks before release dates, and the audience didn't expect immediate reaction. Yeah, I mean, we really went to these reviews. Because, like you said, they got advanced copies. They got time mm-hmm. to actually sit on the record. We actually used to read these reviews not only for validation, but really recommendations, too. And like Coop said, when you know. put in It Was Written and your ears are telling you, like, yo, this shit is dope. This dude is really taking it there. And you're reading this stuff. You're like, am I tripping or am I giving Nas the benefit of the doubt because he's Nas? So this especially okay, when so we was kids, we were looking to these journalists for I don't want to say guidance, but yeah, affirmation that I know my hip hop because we look at you as people who know their hip hop. So how about this? This is what I mean about how I've always kind of like been ahead, and people have always come to me. Let me tell you one of the first real hip hop conversations I remember having. I was sitting at breakfast at Alexander Graham Middle School after Liquid Swords had came out. 
sitting at the table. I'm going to tell you who's sitting at the table. My homie Boo Boo. I seen Boo Boo on my 40th birthday. These is all West Boulevard niggas from the West Side Shark. My homie Boo Boo sitting at the table. Uh, the twins are sitting at the table. Jared and Jarris, light-skinned twins from Little Rock. Uh, nigga Big Tony Romeo. Tony Tony used to do a DJ or a radio show up in Charlotte. He was the other hip-hop head from the block along with me. I stayed across the street from Boulevard Homes. He lived uh, up in Ponderosa right up the street. We had the homie Dion. Dion's family lived on the same side of the street of the house my family lived on. We was all eating breakfast one morning. Everybody hungry as fucking nobody saying something. Dion just looked up. He said, cool. He said, that liquid sword's better than that purple tape? And I stopped and I just put my head down and I was like, I was like, the rhymes is good. I was like, I don't know if it feel like the purple tape. He's like, I don't think it's as good as the purple tape. Mm. I was like, I think it's close. He's like, I don't think it's close. The review from the source came out and it gave Liquid Swords a four. The purple tape, it got four and a half. Dion came back and he was like, Coop, you was right. It was closer than maybe I had thought. Mm. That's how much weight they used to have. Their validation meant a lot, man. Like, That's how even, much weight they used to have. We and used really to the dream. reality of the matter, and the really the reality of the matter, and keep in mind, these are still, because keep in mind, this is the year before It Was Written came out. So I'm 13 when I'm saying this. And even with that being said, it's like looking back on it, it's like, well, those are both five Mike albums for totally different reasons, even though the Purple Tape is still better. Than me. You know, the they dream mattered. was to go they out there. Like that. They mattered on the block like that. The dream was to go out there and make a five Mike album or make an album that one would consider to be five Mikes. You know what I'm saying? Those things meant a lot, man. Um, 007 something. with the Super Chat says uh, the message is one of the greatest ways to start off an album in hip hop history. Uh, swings yeah. and Biggie. Um, you only do that if you are the GOAT or Tupac. I, you know what? It's funny you say that about um, the message. I, I think it, I was I reading. What was I, I reading? It. I was reading I one it, of these. I like, oh, this is what it is. I was reading a Vibe, I guess, rehashed article about it was written. Because we can't find the original Vibe interview. Right. Uh, not interview, but review. But when yeah. you Google Vibe and it was written, they have like a 20th book? anniversary or like a revamp or I something. And they said something about in there that Nas was throwing shots at Jay with the uh, with the Lexus, Lexus TV sets the minimum. Ill yeah. sex adrenaline. Yeah. And, and you know what? And they also called it was written a masterpiece now. So. Oh, well, guess what? It got called adequate on the original review. Yeah. Adequate and not as satisfying as the first. After the writer had to compare it to Paid in Full, which he came out literally, what, nine years before it. The Greatest Adventures of Slick Rick, which came out seven years before, and by all means necessary, which came out nine years before it. He well, literally hold on, had hold on. Did they compare that to those albums or Illmatic to those albums? Illmatic, I'm sorry. Okay. That was how the article started. You're right. I'm sorry. We yeah, I mean, because, I mean, but. I'm just saying why. That shouldn't even the be the case. Too. Like, we shouldn't even be talking about Illmatic well, when we're talking about Illmatic. Well, here's the thing about it, too. This is what I mean. Well, here's where the journalistic integrity of Chris X come into play. Well, it's like, well, don't compare Rakim's first album to Nas' second album. Exactly. Compare Rakim's second album to Nas' second album. That's what I was going to say. Like, See, but they, Mike, they couldn't have that conversation because it's like I came on this podcast and said a couple weeks ago, I believe, when I sat down and realized, it's like, hold on. I'm like, it was written lyrically is a solo mission outside of affirmative action and live nigga rap. Like, it's just niggas singing on hooks with him. It's a solo mission. I'm like, that's like double the output of Follow the Leader. And so what I would submit to you is that lyrically, where Follow the Leader holds itself, well, Nas kind of extended that on It Was Written, and guys like him as journalists that were from Brooklyn and from Queens, they weren't ready to have that conversation about Nas maybe lyrically taking mm. it somewhere that Rockham hadn't taken it. And, mm. and I can say that respectfully, because people have made me go back and listen hard, hard to Lupe stuff for me to be like, well, yeah, well, lyrically, he's taking it somewhere else. But but here's the difference. Nas was lyrically and song wise going somewhere else. Like Rakim has no I gave you power on follow the leader. He's got follow the leader. He's got lyrics of fury. He don't have I gave you power. Mike, if you're going to compare the albums, this is what I mean about how they would have to give Nas props, even if they were to compare it to follow the leader. And that's why he chose paid in full. Well, what does Follow the Leader have for the setup and shootouts in terms of telling them? You get what I'm saying? No, no, you are. You do? I don't Where's think that Nas has anything. Where's nigga rap? You know, I, was, I would say, you know, to play devil's advocate, does Nas have anything for lyrics of Fury, but you could go message take it in there. Blood. You could go take it in blood. You could you go, go take it setup. in blood. Yeah. Yeah, no, you can go take it in blood. You can go right to take it in blood. It's on par. 
LP with the super chat says, um, uh, that narrative carried over to the blog era. He was getting hate from the blogs from 2006 to 2012. Uh, there was a website called Smarten Up Nas. Nas, <laughs> wow. Now, Nas loss was a trend. That's crazy. This is what I mean. So, so, so <clears throat> when we're talking about this narrative about Nas, since Elliot Wilson likes to sit up there and pull tweets like he's not the main person responsible. Right. Welcome to the main person responsible. Well, let's open up all together. He's like, if we want to have that, Queens, if we like, want to have that dialogue, then yeah, we got to start with you, Mr. Wilson. Like, yeah. We got to start Mr. with you Paul, to see what's Mr. going on. Mr. Ego Tripping, the source in double XL. Yeah. I got bail money, double XL money. You yeah. got flash now, but Tom will reveal money. Where'd that line come from? That's 97, Mike. That's what I'm saying. That's inside track stuff when he's spitting those bars out. That dude was up there working, but he was working for Elliot Wilson to make Elliot Wilson's next move. John I Rob, say with the super chat says, uh, hands doing a high five. <laughs> it's, it's, Appreciate the high five. We got I, Dame I, I, over I, here. I'd like says, to say, is, I want to keep. Go ahead. Go ahead, Mike. No, I was ahead. just going to get to the super chat. Uh, Dame uh, 252 says, it's Street Dreams Remix, the best lyrical performance on It Was Written. He, no. went, he got down on that shit. He did. He did. Still not better than taking in blood, silent murder, or I gave you power. It would be Lyrically, though, and you know how I feel about Silent Murder. If we talk about verse for verse, he's going in on Street Dreams Remix. I don't know. I don't know. Jay Short with the Super Chat says, three and a half no, mics my, ratings. No. Three and a half mic ratings could end a career back then. Yeah, yeah they Especially gave for certain people. So I, so this is what I mean. It's like, well... That's a lot of power, though. You know no, what I'm how saying? Much, how much of a flame keeper is he? Like, how much of a gatekeeper is he? It's like, well, you gave it was written four mics. Well, you gave reasonable doubt four mics. Muddy Waters, four mics. Capital Punishment, four mics. Hold on. I'm going to tell you what the... It's not really about us, the ratings, though, Coop. It's about the words. You gave Dark and Hell is Hot four mics. Mike, after I'd heard... Yeah. I, by the time we got the song nine, I was like, this is a five-mic album. I don't care what the rest of the album sounds like. Give him a five right... Give him a five right now. I ain't never heard nobody come like this before. No, for real. Like, it's Dark the Hell Five is a five mic album. Can we get a five right now? Yeah, yeah. Mike, by the time Damien went off, I was like, this is a five mic album. I was like, I don't know what everybody else just heard. Listen, like, the versatility. That's before How's It Going Down or Stop Being Greedy or ATF even come on. I'm like, it's a five mic album. DMX did everything on that album. He did everything. He, he gave done you hit song. records. Four. Get, they gave it a four. He that, was the music editor insane. when they gave his Dark and Hell is Hot a four. You couldn't even get a four and a half out of his Dark and Hell is Hot. You don't know what you're talking about, fam. Nah, that's crazy, man. Think about yeah. it. Volume one and it's Dark and Hell is Hot share the same rating in the history of the source. Volume two is four and a half, right? Correct. Yeah. yeah. There's no way in the world. And I love Jay, and I'm a Jay-Z fan, yeah. man. But yeah, it's Dark and Hell is Hot or something else. And see, the thing is, that's not even like revisionist history stuff. It's dark and hell is hot. When it hit, everybody was on the same page. Like, we're bro, all this nigga page. is next. Yeah. We're all on the same page. Like, this is a classic. We're all it on had the, same the hit page. records. It had the storytelling. It had the album cuts. It, originality. He gave originality. Flow, the delivery, flow, the tracks, the, production. The story. His appearances. Yeah. There was, no, yeah. There was nothing that There's that album nothing was missing from that album. Yeah. It like, hold on. So for me, like, it's dark and hell is hot. Is like, in terms of like, hardcore East Coast gangster rap, it like sit next like to the infamous. It's like one of the it's best like, debut the dark, albums. The, ever. It's it's it, like for me, it's like it's the infamous and it's dark and hell is hot. And then there's like the shit that these other niggas did that said that they was doing hardcore shit. You know what I'm saying? Unknown name says uh, can't discount payola in the '90s. Dame has admitted to paying writers and uh, DJs. DJs. See? Yeah. yeah. That's what I'm saying. Ain't nothing wrong with that. that. You know what I mean? Like, that's no, just part of the game. You, they're ambitious. Yeah. They're ambitious. Listen, man, that's part of the game, and it's all good. Right. I was in radio for years, and that's part of the game. I know radio people want to deny it, whatever, whatever. My only thing is you didn't have to bash one guy. To you know, give credit that's well deserved to another. Now I don't know if they were trying to get Nas to pay them, and Nas never paid them. I don't know what it is, right. but see, so this is what I'm saying. See, like dudes be shook to just say stuff. It's like Mike for the time that you and I were down here around the time that you were doing radio, you and I were doing music. It's like, oh no, 
every major DJ on the radio down here had a price tag on it. And of I course. wish one of these motherfuckers would make it seem like they had the type of integrity where that wasn't the case out here. You and oh. me was really out here. There's yeah. a price tag on all these niggas. I could tell you, if you gave me a name, I could tell you who costs what still off the top of my head. Yeah. But the prices probably went up because of inflation. <laughs> right. LP with the Super Chat says, uh, Jay was the first, uh, I'm sorry, Jay was on the first cover of XXL with Master P in 1997. Master Nobody had him on the pedestal in 1997. This was always in the works between the both of them. Think um, about this. In 1997 is when he made volume one. Yeah. Not reasonable doubt. What are you doing on the cover of a magazine after all your singles fail? Was Think about after all the singles is watching fail. though? Huh? Was this after Streets is watching though? Because Maybe Streets is watching Alicia. gave a resurgence. I don't know which month uh, that XXL. Streets is watching wasn't up. popping like that in the streets month. It wasn't. Thought it was. I mean, I love Celebration. The end. Celebration's good. I mean, you know. Um, like the- Michael Williams with the super chat says Jay dismissing. I'm sorry, Jay dismissing. It was written on Takeover was also very damaging. It just reinforced it just reinforced this narrative of it was written being underwhelming. Right. One was in. It's like one was in. It's like, well, he's out rapping you on your best album. How is his shit in? He's That is a narrative. But that, so let's go back to the narrative. This is what I'm talking about, about how you get to control things. It's like, well, if his shit was in, what is reasonable doubt? Because they're comparable albums. So is your best album in? Well, the thing <laughs> is, though, if there weren't reviews like the ones that we just highlighted to go over and to reference to when we're talking about it was written, he wouldn't have been able to say those things in that way. You know what I mean? That well, see, just validated that type of talk. Right. Well, see, here's what I'm saying. When you suck at your job as a music editor, you see, like, when you give something like, I don't know, it was written four mics. It probably deserves four and a half or five. And then you come along and like, like how I'll give it four and a half. It's not a five. It's not a five. Because we four. know what he can do. Mike, can I ask you something? Yeah. How can you say that 96 Nas is the best rapper or the best lyricist ever? And this is the performance that you're talking about and it not be a five. What's because keeping it from being songs. a five for you? Uh, no, 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 I'm asking. I'm not like being funny. I really want to No, know. no, no, I'm answering. It, it's the songs. You know, I think that when we talk about, and I hate to go to Illmatic when we're splitting hairs here, we can go to any other great album too, but the song making isn't at that level. Okay. Even though his raps are, and it's kind of like what you were saying with uh, Lupe, man, where it's like, Sometimes to make a great record or individual songs, you might have to tone down some of that, you know, I'm saying crazy lyricism. So and I biggest... think the Illmatic was just that perfect blend of that. It was he was clearly a better rapper on it was written, but the songs aren't better. Okay. So here's what I would submit to you. Is the blueprint better than it was written? I think so, yeah. Pull the songs up. I bet you it's not. See, because everything that you're saying about the blueprint, the blueprint has more of those holes than it was written does. Because it was written has Nas is coming, Black Girl Lost, and Watch Them Niggas. Now go pull up the worst three songs from the blueprint and think about what you're saying. I'm just, I'm just, I'm just giving that to give you some context. I think the funny thing about the blueprint, and I know we've talked about this before, and like in reference to it and B and it and uh, Supreme Clientele, I think that its holes. Are, da- are lows, right? Jigga, jigga, that nigga, jigga, and those records. Those yeah. are lows, but the high points are super high. I can say the same thing about It Was Written. That's why I'm comparing the two. They're very actually, that's what I'm saying. Like, like Jay's best two albums are actually comparable to Nas's second best work, not his first one. So it's like when you're saying the highs are high, you mean stuff like, I don't know, I gave you power or take it in blood or live nigga rap. Like well, the I highs are that- super high. Right. It's the, the Blueprint is Jay's second best album, where I think it was written is probably Nas's second best album, right? That's why I'm bringing it up. See, this is why well, I'm we saying... We can go song for song. We can go track for track. Yeah, we can go track for track. It's about to be all bad for you, though. Let me get to these Super Chats real quick. Michael oh, Holmes says, uh, Cool G Rap and Nas versus uh, Kane and Biggie. Yeah, that would be crazy. <sighs> crazy. Um, crazy. Let's see. Cinematic 06 says... That's why Nas may hate me now, due to all of the hate that he was getting after it was written. This is true. Um, These are 007 says, uh, it was written as five mics. 
Mike, you were comparing Nas to Nas, comparing Nas to the field. That's why he's the GOAT. Compare That's Nas what I'm trying to, to say. It's like you're saying it was written. Okay, so Mike, the same thing that you're saying, these these writers need to stop. And I'm, and I'm saying this respectfully. The same reason that you're saying that these albums from Nas aren't five, well, you're saying it for the same reason these writers are. You're saying it because it's not Illmatic. Not all fives are created the same. And so what it's I true, to but be, I mean, I don't want to say like it's not Illmatic. Okay. I'm just saying so, Illmatic so, 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 is so, the standard on, but, but when it I'm, comes to song making. You think it was written as Nas' the second best album, okay? Correct? I, You know, it's between that and Stillmatic. It's very okay. close. Okay. Braveheart what Party saying? might keep it away from that. Okay, so so what you're saying, so essentially what you're saying is the guy who you deem is the greatest MC of all time only has one five out of five album. That's what you're saying when you're saying that, though. Hmm. So, so that's what I'm saying. It's like, how is what you're saying different than what the journalists are saying? You're kind I of could be you're not being, inaccurate. You're not enough. being as harsh as the journalists are, but you're still judging it on the same level. Illmatic, I look at Illmatic the way I look at it, it takes a nation to millions. The way I look at Doggy Style, the way I look at The Greatest Adventures of Slick Rick, it's like, oh, well, you're not making that again. It's a one of one. It's a one of one. So if you're just judging it was written on hip hop standards, what I'm telling you is it was written like Reasonable Doubt and the Blueprint have more inconsistency song wise than it was written. We can pull it up, Mike. That's what I'm saying. So it's well, like, let's it's go to the Blueprint real quick. Let's go I was about to say, so if you think the Blueprint and, it, and Reasonable Doubt is a five, it was written as a five because. Illmatic is somewhere I, don't know, I don't think blue the blueprints of five. You know, and I only say ooh, that because ooh, I didn't I didn't ooh, feel ooh. like no I take I take right. I mean, here's my reasoning, right? I, take, I don't think Jigga Jigga that nigga Jigga, Ola Ovito, and Renegade are five songs. You know, okay. this is the thing. Every this is the thing, right? Five all right so five. Let me put this in context. And like you said, all fives aren't created equal. The album that got five mics before the blueprint was a Kumina. And no, that but fix. standard. Oh no, no, Fix was after the blueprint. You're right. Okay. Fix was 02. So the album that got five mics before the blueprint was a Kumina. So that was like fixated in my head as like, yo, you gotta make the perfect album. So and with the was the last one that before are, that, Mike. Huh? So Illmatic and a Quim- you understand that after nineteen ninety four, only two Albums got five mics. That was a Quimini and Illmatic. No, Life After Death got it. I don't. But it's hard to count that, right? I don't count that. Yeah. Uh, Mike 100 with a super chat says, Don't dodge, Coop. Mike, uh, don't dodge, Coop, Mike. Compare the songs, bro. No, we about to do it. No, I'm just. Andre Shashir says, It was written as better than the blueprint. So this is what I'm about to say. So what, if I told you, so what if I even told you, Mike, that reading all this media and this journalism enough even affected the way that you're rating things right now? I was thinking the same thing. I think no, that, it has. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm saying it has. respectfully because what I'm saying is, is that in your mind, this is what I mean about how it made me question it, it was fits. written. Because when I listened to it was written, it's like, well, it was written is better than Reasonable Doubt if you take the impact from Reasonable Doubt out. If you just go song for song... It was written as better. Now, even when I'm rating them, that's why I have Reasonable Doubt at 21, but it was written at 29 because the, re- the impact of Reasonable Doubt is so heavy. But if we're talking song for song, album for album, they're they're both fives. They're just fives created differently. Reasonable Doubt and the Blueprint have more gaps than it was written. They do. Because if, if, if Nas is coming and watch them niggas and Black Girl Lost are your bottom three songs, Jay's in trouble. Because you got to put Jigga That Nigga and Whole I Ho Veto up against Nas is coming. If well, Black Girl Lost, can you say L? Well, can let, you well say let's Ray? do <laughs> I got to charge my phone. Hold on, hold on. Listen to this. Hold on. You're going to put come in age, Mike, come in the age of Black Girl Lost. <laughs> you feel what I'm saying? Right. No, no. That's real. Right. Coming of like, age does on, not dude. stand like, a that chance on that. Like, that thoughts. I love the way Jay's rhyming. He's not rhyming better than Nas is rhyming on Watch Them Niggas on Cashmere Thoughts. Well, you know what? I didn't even, Let's I line them up. Love, you got it was written in front of you. I'm gonna tell you something else too. I didn't even love the fact that they gave Jay Z rhyme of the month for Cashmere Thoughts and skipped over the, the evils and the dead presidents first. Me too. That that happened while Elliot Wilson was there too. Maybe these niggas do these niggas need Q-tips? Shout you out know? to my man Q-tip. The L Web One Hundred says, mean? "Are we counting the Lost Tapes as a studio album? Because that's definitely his second best album." 
We we're not going there yet, fam. We're not going there yet. We're not I bringing the Lost Tapes into count, this. You got to count Lost Tapes as a studio album, but, but I still but think the Lost Tapes don't have features. It was written as yeah. features. Yeah. The Blueprint, Reasonable Doubt has features. I told you, like I told you, man, his his rhyme performances on Illmatic, Lost Tapes. It was written. It's like, well, you're not gonna find that because those are solo missions outside of literally, like. These between those three albums, these are the guest verses you get. You get A Z on Life's a Bitch, you get A Z, Foxy Brown, and Cormega on Affirmative Action, and you get Havoc and Prodigy on Live Nigga Rap. On those three albums, the rest of that is Nas. That's the best rhyme shit ever for one MC. I love Live rapping. Nigga Rap. And when you open up that book, that booklet for it was written, and you see all of those words. Like so many verses. For the Projects people who didn't like, have the CD back in the day. But man, yeah, when you so get look, that CD and you open up that man, book, it's like, damn, this is a lot of rhymes. Man, Projects is like Kuwait. Yeah. IMC Simon says, it was written as better than the Blueprint. Okay, you guys are saying it was written as better than the Blueprint. That's what We're I'm about trying to, to tell you. Jay's best shit is like Nas's second or third best shit. This is why I've always said Nas is better, because Jay's best shit... Is like Nas's second or third best shit, but let's go. Man, man, with the super chat says Nas got three five mic albums, uh, four and a half, maybe some five. four and a halves, and a few four mic albums. I mean, I think he's got. I mean, depending on how Magic is gonna rate and how Magic is gonna fall, you know what I'm saying? But it's like, truthfully, if you were to hear me call it, if how about this? If we're not, if we're counting the version of Stillmatic that came out without Braveheart Party. Well, he's got four fives in my opinion because he does have Illmatic. It was written the Lost Tapes and Stillmatic. Those are fives. Those are fives. And Magic might be a five. So in my mind, he might have five fives. But I'm a fan, so I try not to be biased. But I'm taking at least three of those. That's to the a bank. lot. I, I'm, no, I'm, I'm taking, cool with you no, taking three. But, but hold on, hold on. But I, I but I'm taking Illmatic mm-hmm. Lost Tapes, and it was written like to the bank with me. The Magic, with Magic the doesn't have any says. gaps, Mike. Magic doesn't have any gaps unless you want like some big hit record. Like it doesn't have a What's My Name. Or a get at me dog, like but that's pretty much like all the album like that is missing. Not all fives are created the same. Pray for Paris doesn't have a song like that either. Neither does Alfredo. LP with the super chat says Mike used to have the same opinion as Elliot. LOL. You know what? I don't want to say I had the same opinion, but I think that my opinions about Nas have been framed by a lot of these reviews over the years. Until I really start Digging in, well, I mean, obviously, I knew the music, but just start digging into the narratives that a lot of these articles are putting out there. And I'm like, this isn't a fair take in the same way that we actually look at other artists and, you know, in the takes that we have on them for their sophomore, third, fourth albums. It yeah. seems seems very biased when it comes to Nas. But no, I think that, that I never bought that take about Nas being the worst beat picker. Like, I always thought. I mean, the man has so many great beats in his catalog. I know a whole lot of artists that we could give that title to, and they don't have a Nas's like or a Made You Look in their beat catalog selection. No, not even that. Or the stuff that's on Illmatic. Well, see, here's the thing. Nas isn't a bad beat picker. Okay, styles make fights. Some of the beats don't fit him. Like, I'll give you an example of a dope-ass beat that doesn't fit him. Uchi Wally. No, 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 that beat banging. I don't care what you tell me. Uchi Wally's a great beat. Yeah. I remember hearing that beat before hearing the song. Like, you remember that MTV show, yep, DFX? I already know. Yep. They used to play that shit in the background. I was like, whatever beat that is, that shit's hard. That's crazy. Yeah. Yeah, that beat crazy. Yeah. Hold on, look. Most and Talib wanted that beat. Yeah, I heard that about that. crazy. That, that I'm about to say, that ain't just like some hit record beat. No, no, no. That's an MC beat right there. It's like an MC hear that, and he's like, what's that? Give me that. And see, here's the thing about it, too. Nas was at the point, money-wise, that he could outbid niggas for a beat like that. So it was almost like he took that beat because he could afford that beat. He couldn't afford that beat before. You feel what I'm saying? But how like Uchi Wally, let's just go to the primo stuff. How are you going to say he's a bad beat picker with the primo stuff? You don't like New York State of Mind? Memory Lane? Can I interest you in Nas is like? Can I interest you motherfuckers in rhyming over Nas is like? You feel what I'm saying? So it's like when Cats be saying it, even you want to know a beat that I like, even though he didn't do a good job with it? Mike, the flyest is a dope beat. Mm-hmm. The beat to the flyest is dope. It's just not for Nas. It's not the beat that's a problem. That beat doesn't fit that artist. That don't mean the artist is whack. That don't mean the beat is whack. That mean it don't fit. This is the about flyest. You ain't talking about the record with uh, it's on Stillmatic with AZ, right? No, the flyest. Charlie's oh. Angels. Gotcha, gotcha. Okay. Yeah, where you got the Indian girl sample singing.